Hello, I'm Ken Burrell from Pragmatic PMO. This is one of a series of videos expanding on the Success Story Shared initiative started in South Africa by Linky van der Merwe of Virtual Project Consulting and Louise Worsley of Pi Cubed, and which has their enthusiastic support. Aldous Huxley said that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important of all the lessons of history. Project management research has shown that project managers prefer to learn by face-to-face -face interaction rather than by searching through lessons learned databases. I think that project managers can learn a lot from each other's success stories and even more from each other's scars. So as part of my campaign for real project managers, on your behalf I'm talking to some real project managers I've had the pleasure of working alongside so that you can benefit from their experience. Today I'm delighted to have with me John McIntyre who's going to share some of his experiences with us. John, I'd like you to start if you can by introducing yourself and giving us a flavour of your background and how you got into project management. Thanks, Ken. Uh, I'm John McIntyre. Um, I run a website called hotpmo.com. Um, came into project management in, a, it's an easy one to remember because it was Y2K, so it was about year 2000, which means I can do a fairly easy maths calculation and work out I've been doing it for about 18 years. So I've worked across banking, um, telecoms, uh, shipping, um, entertainment, kind of you name it, I've probably dabbled a bit at some point or another. So mm -hmm. that's given me quite a broad background to uh, draw from and uh, quite a few interesting experiences along the way. Okay, and what sort of things do you do these days, project management wise? Um, nowadays, so I've moved on from um, project management to running a um, large enterprise PMO. Um, my team is um, reports directly into the exec team. There's a traditional PMO team who do centralised reporting, uh, try and work out standards and the most efficient ways of doing things in our organisation and share, evangelise and coach people in those. Then I've got a fantastic team of project managers, some of whom are doing fairly traditional, what we tend to call waterfall project management, things that have a very clear start, middle, end. I've got some who work more closely with agile projects who are looking at continuous delivery of a product. And then alongside those, I've got a small coaching function as well who tend to focus on coaching teams, usually agile software teams, to look at how they're working, helping them work effectively and really sort of maximise the, um, the ideas the, and the output and the things they're delivering. Okay, so thinking back over your project management career, can you give us an example of a SCAR? So something that went wrong on a project that you were managing and how you recovered from it? Uh, it was a project that was involving rolling out new technology um, to a, a, across the UK. So we'd done our homework and worked it out and decided that you could roll out maybe four of these things to four different sites in a day with one person. When it got down to the detail of that, we found that actually some of these things needed swap, swapping out on ships. And these ships had a fairly unique function. They um, would go out into the North Sea. Mm -hmm. There was a bank where they could hoover up sand from the seabed. And that sand would then come back to be used in everything from um, kids sand pits to cement mixing. Um, now those those ships are only really making money when they're out there hoovering and when they're alongside they need that's like a formula one pit stop they need to be all hands to the literally to the pumps yeah. pumping all off and getting out again which means they've got no time for me in my technology projects the only way around this was to put the engineer and the technology on the ship wait till they've gone out and calmed down a bit and then explain to them how the technology worked and uh, do the transition for them great except you don't quite know when these things are going to dock again and where they're going to dock because it depends on the price of sand and the weather and how quickly they've been able to hoover up. So what I was finding was the, the plans that I had for delivering rapidly at four sites a day were thrown into complete disarray because I was dropping en uh, engineers onto ships and getting a call anything up to five days later saying my engineer was landing in Rotterdam, usually with about three or four hours notice on a ship to shore radio system. Um, that completely um, blew all the plans I had. It upset a lot of the out sites. Out of the water. Uh, literally out of the water, yes. It, um, it um, upset um, several of the clients that we had, um, that we'd planned to visit on days because they suddenly found we couldn't visit them for another four or five days, um, and which led to a lot of people being unhappy with the project and a perception that we were being late and everything was running badly. That's a pretty sticky situation. How did you recover? where originally we'd taken quite a 
logical approach to the planning. We'd assumed that we had a list of locations in the UK. We knew where they were. We'd mapped those out. We'd worked out we could do four a day. And it was a very simple case of allocating one person to four of those per day, getting them into regions together and making that happen. And what we had to do was come up with very, very flexible plans to take those types of scenario into account. We'd have a number of clients. We'd sort of rank them by how flexible they were. Some some of our sites they would give you a time slot and you absolutely had to be there at that time or you would have to reschedule for weeks or months later whereas others were quite flexible and as long as you had a broad window that was fine and you could phone them that day and be flexible on it if i got somebody back off a ship in the uk within 24 hours which was nice that's great i had a lot of flexible sites i could instantly put those people on and we'd be getting ahead of schedule if i found i was losing them for five or six days out at sea um, then i again i i knew I had the very very rigid fixed um, high profile sites covered off and we could make the time up later on so flexible planning was the key to pulling that one back and restoring confidence in us so based on that experience what would your advice be to other people what would you suggest they should do differently whilst the approach we took was entirely valid and was and proved proved its worth as a macro level planning and estimation tool I think the key lesson is it's is not to extrapolate down and make very detailed assumptions on off the back of that. Okay, so how about a success story? So something you did that went particularly well on a project or something that you do regularly that makes things go well? If you're in an organisation that is delivering increments to a feature, so say you're running a website and you're delivering a new feature for that website and the reason you're delivering that is because you want to improve your product, mm -hmm. That's fine. You can focus on getting, um, putting the work in, getting the highest quality product you can and delivering that when it's ready. If you're a company that's delivering because you've got a fixed deadline, uh, maybe you've got a supplier um, who's mandated something in a contract, maybe you're working towards an event, um, that can be far more challenging. And what you'll find is you're then working with um, commercial people who are trying to pin down exactly when something will be delivered. And whilst in theory um, working to an agile method where you have a velocity for teams it should be more predictable to forecast when something will be delivered that isn't always the case and it can be quite challenging now when you look across multiple teams and you look at stories that teams are delivering with a big enough sample size stories broadly end up being about the same size yes you'll get some variances on those i'm not telling you what size that is because that will change by company and change mm -hmm. by environment and situation but broadly speaking you can start to get a feeling and sort of say okay so for for, for this team a story usually takes them around four days that's irrelevant of how big that story is because you're doing this over a big sample size and saying normally that's like that now the beauty of that is for estimation you can actually say how big is this in terms of stories you don't need to estimate that in story points or anything like that you say this feels like it's about 30 stories of work which is great now what I've then seen teams do is take that, apply a velocity figure to it, and then say, well, therefore our delivery date is this. Mm -hmm. That's where things get sticky because what that is normally giving you is an average. Yep. That is the average date that will be delivered. And as we know from my SCAR earlier, yep. average doesn't always mean what it says. If you're contracting that, it's quite dangerous. And what Based on those memories, we played around with it. There's some great work done by um, uh, Tony McGuinness um, and, uh, and Dan North's done some investigation into this as well. But looking at using um, the concept of Monte Carlo analysis, yes. but applied, applied carefully and used in the right way, it can be a really valuable tool in these situations. Um, so by taking a his historical um, sample of stories and how they were sized and how long they actually took to deliver, running that through a Monte Carlo simulation, you can actually work out what's my 50th percentile, 80th percentile, yeah. 90th percentile. What that gives you is a unique conversation you can have with your commercial people or your clients or anyone else to say, right, based on what we think this piece of work is, the average time we'll deliver this, the velocity on this is actually we'll deliver this in two months time, for example. However, if you're contracting to this, then maybe you want to increase our chances of delivering to it and have a high degree of confidence. So we might say, let's take the 80th percentile. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying there is if this is a 30 story project 
80% of the time we know we can deliver 30 stories in at the 80th percentile, which might be for argument's sake three months. So maybe that would be the better one to contract around. Now, if that date is absolutely drop dead and there's massive financial penalties and it's a life or death project, you might be pushing that to 90, 95th percentile. Yeah. And what you might find is with all the edge cases in there, that might suddenly skew out to six months, seven months, eight months. But it's a great tool for having those conversations that take it away from a hard deadline, um, take it away from those answers that you normally get from velocity modeling where you end up with a, a date that you're normally 50-50 chance of delivering and actually put some of that, share some of that risk. You're getting buy-in from the, from the customer, from the stakeholder, from the business. What do we want to say? This feels like something we can do with an 80% confidence by that date. If you're not happy with that, what do we take out what's the amount of stuff we do to give the confidence level that you're happy with now we need to be careful because these are unique projects sometimes they are going to skew there is still that risk and you can't overlook the 20 percent it's entirely possible that you may use that modeling scenario run five projects in a row and every every single one mm -hmm. of them runs past that date because that's entirely statistically feasible yeah. but it's still it, it's not a perfect model but there are no perfect models John, thanks for your time and your insights. So today we've heard from John about something that went wrong on a project he was managing and about something that he does regularly that helps things to go well. Anton Chekhov said, knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. I think the value of learning comes not from documenting the past, but from changing what we do in the future. So my challenge to you is, what can you learn from this? What will you do differently in your projects as a result of John's experience? Let me know in the comments. If you enjoyed this video and found it stimulating, please leave a comment or a like or both or share it with others on social media. If you think these videos are useful and interesting, let me know and I'll make more of them. If you'd like to appear in one, let me know. For other videos on project management topics, take a look at my video channel. For articles on project management and PMO topics, visit my website pragmaticpmo.com or follow me on Twitter at pragmaticpmo. To connect with me more personally, search LinkedIn for Ken Burrell Pragmatic PMO. In the meantime, until the next time, thanks for watching.